everyone, and welcome to Glennon Performing Arts Theater Workshop. This month, for our spooky theme, I am going to be talking about how to act scary. I do have some experience with this, as I have been an actor in a number of haunted houses, as well as a few other spooky things, including playing one of the evils in our original student play that we performed a few years ago for Main Stage with Lionheart Productions, that was called Of Gods and Mortals. It was based on Greek mythology, and I played one of the evils that came out of Pandora's box. Fun fact for you, I also was one of the people who wrote that play. Pretty cool, you ask me. Now, without further ado, we will begin, and I will teach you some of the tips and tricks I know on how to act scary. So, first off, we need to ask ourselves a question. What makes something scary? Well, immediately when you think of some horror films, you might be thinking of something like gore, murder, blood, violence, but we can't really represent those things on stage, at least not in a way that's really authentic. So if we really want to scare people, we're better off going on a different route and aiming more so for suspense, the supernatural, the fear of the dark. Borrowing from the Theories around Gothic literature, there are two different kinds of fear. One is horror, which is the fear of what's happening in that moment. It stems from disgust and pain. So that's that fear of things that are gory and violent. The other kind of fear, the one that we're interested in today, is terror, the fear of what? might happen. That comes from suspense, from anticipation, from our expectations. As humans, we're afraid, naturally, of things we don't know or understand. Things that might surprise us, or things that are in general just slightly wrong. Like mannequins, for example. Mannequins are pretty creepy because they're human-like. Some of them look almost exactly like humans, but they're not alive. They enter into that realm that's called the uncanny valley, which is where something is so close to being what it's supposed to be. There's just something that our brain can recognize as wrong. And that wrongness leads us to a fear of what might possibly happen. What might possibly be, be behind, hiding underneath of a surface that looks at first glance like it might be normal. I'll give you an example of a quote that my friend found online once. It's very strange. And it's creepy because it is strange. You don't know your teeth. They whisper your future in your ear. Absolutely terrifying because it's completely unexpected. The statement, you don't know your teeth, it's discomforting because, well, you should know your teeth. They're in your mouth. So the idea that your teeth might be whispering something to you, that you might not know them, it inherently sets us on edge because that is so wrong and unnatural and it is not what we're expecting. And if our teeth are capable of whispering to us, what else might they be doing? So how does that all translate into acting? There's a few basic things that I'm going to talk about today in terms of that. I'm going to divide it into three categories. First is face and facial expressions. So talking about contrasting emotions, using unnatural movements, exaggerated expressions. 
And then voice, again, talking about how we can be unnatural or unexpected with our voice and use that to create fear in the people watching us. As well as the final category I'm going to talk about is movement. So what we can do with our bodies as a whole, that can be terrifying. So talking about faces, think of different haunted houses you've been in, different scary movies that you've seen. Think of the movie It, the new one that came out. Pennywise's makeup is designed to exaggerate his facial expressions. So when we see this little clown in the sewer or in the shadows or anywhere else, we see him this weird little smile. He's got the big bug eyes. But at the same time as he's smiling, his eyes don't share that happiness. So that's one of the biggest and one of my go-to ways to be creepy. If you can smile without your eyes being engaged, it is automatically disturbing because when we see someone smile and it's a genuine smile, you're going to see the corners of, of, of their eyes crinkle. You're going to see their cheeks lift up. But when somebody smiles with just their mouth and without the rest of their face, it's inherently creepy because we know that they're faking something. They're hiding something. They might be up to something else. The other thing that is one of my go-tos is the big eyes. It works for me because I do naturally have very big eyes, but it's exaggerating features to make them unnatural. So whatever your own features are that you can use to exaggerate. If you're somebody who has a particularly wide smile, you can use that. If you're somebody who has a long tongue, you can stick your tongue out. For me, I like to use my big eyes. And one of the other relatively easy things that you can train yourself at to be creepy is simply not blinking. Because we expect people to blink when they make dead eye contact with us and don't blink for way too long, we're automatically creeped out by it because that is not something we want to see. That is not something we're expecting. That is not something we attach to our idea of human. But at the same time as big exaggerated faces, the big exaggerated happy, or the dead eyes, or an exaggerated angry face with the eyebrows furled, at the same time as those things can be scary, the exact opposite can be scary too. A completely dead expression with no emotion at all. One of the things that is automatically a go-to when talking about faces in things that are trying to be scary is eye contact. People don't really like when you stare at them dead in the eyes. In polite conversation, we do look at each other in the eyes, we do make eye contact, but our eyes naturally drift to look at other things. Motion that's around us, looking at their nose sometimes instead of in their eyes, looking at their mouth as they speak, at their hands as they gesture. But if you just stare somebody dead in the eyes, it can very quickly make them uncomfortable. And being uncomfortable can lead to being afraid. So my advice to you, if you're looking to work on your facial expressions in terms of trying to be scary, is to at some point go and stare at yourself in the mirror. As you do, see how far you can push your facial expressions, especially in contrasting emotions. Can you make yourself sad in one part of your face, but happy in the other? Can you be exaggeratedly angry can you show your own fear on your face in a way that's going to make it translate onto the other person as well? Can you play with their empathy? The further you can exaggerate your facial expressions, the more impact it's going to have on the person you're trying to scare. Talking about voice. 
most of the things that I said about your face can be applied to your voice as well. You want to contrast emotions, exaggerate, and play with some things that are outside of natural. When we're talking naturally, we, we usually have a relatively flat inflection. So as I'm speaking, I do go up and down a little bit, but I stay within the same little range. But if I'm trying to be scary, I might play with the ranges of my voice. I might pause for too long. I might make my voice too high, too soft, too slow. Or I might make my voice deep, I might talk too fast, I might make you anxious by the fact that I see me anxious myself. If you can make unnatural noises, if you can talk in a noise like this, if you can laugh in a way that is creepy and unnatural, those things are going to create fear. Play into people's expectations. If you're a small person like myself, speaking in a deep voice is concerning to somebody who sees it. A large person speaking in a high voice does the same. But you can also play into the tropes. For example, people are afraid of small children. For some reason, nursery rhymes and giggling when there shouldn't be giggling. The idea that children might know more than they should or be up to things that could cause us harm is genuinely terrifying. So we can play into that trope and we can use these childish voices to greet people up, especially when we combine them with our facial expressions. When we combine them with our facial expressions, we're drawing more into that exaggerated nature. Earlier, I mentioned laughter. Laughter is really effective in terms of trying to scare someone, especially when that person is already somewhat afraid, such as in a haunted house. That laughter in a situation where the person is already tense is unexpected. It breaks the tension in a way that makes them more afraid. It's especially effective when that laughter seems uncontrolled or forced out of a person. That's part of the fear that comes from children or from clowns. Two very common things to be afraid of. So we play into that and we find a laugh that works for us. There can be a deep, menacing laugh. <laughs> or there can be a high-pitched giggle. <laughs> the more unhinged the laughter is, the creepier it seems. Because suddenly we have the question of, is that person in control of themselves? Are they in control of what they're doing? And if they're not in control, what does that mean they might do to us? We can also play with the contrast of emotions in terms of what we're saying and how we say it. If we say something relatively mundane in a really creepy voice, it's going to be scary. If we say something scary in a really plain, mundane voice, that's weird on its own. So I'm going to share my screen with you for a second. Uh, once I figure this out. Share my screen. Share. Present this. There's a sentence on the screen here. What's that behind you? Take a second now and play with that sentence. You can pause the video to do so if you'd like. How many different ways can you say the sentence, what's that behind you? On its own, this sentence is kind of creepy. You're not expecting there to be something behind you. So when somebody says, what's that behind you? It's worrisome. But what are the different ways you can say it? Can you make it scary? 
can you make an infirm mundane sentence? Can it just be, what's that behind you? Or do you want to push it further? Do you want to play into that child to twelve? <laughs> what's, what's that behind you? There's so many different ways to do it. If you look at yourself in the mirror to practice your facial expressions, play with sentences like this. Say some things in different voices. Watch how that voice interacts with the face that you have on. Anything unexpected or exaggerated or unnatural, the things that make you be like, huh, that was weird, those are the things that are going to scare people. If we look at the next slide, I have another sentence for you. A very, very mundane sentence. Please have a seat. Perfectly normal sentence, something your professor might say to you when you walk in the classroom, something you might say to a guest who's coming over for dinner. How can you make this mundane sentence into something terrifying? You can take the time, pause the video, play with it, say it in different voices. If you have a friend with you, say it back and forth to each other. See if you can find things that you land on that say, this is scary. They're not just saying, please have a seat. They're saying something is about to happen. Please have a seat. So, sorry, let me get my screen organized again here. Now that we've talked about our face and our voice and what we're doing with those, what can we do with our bodies? I'm going to stand up for this and I encourage you to do the same. Just stand back a little bit. We're looking at the same effect as the other ones that you did. So you want to push it, exaggerate it, make your movements and your body unnatural. If you're standing up straight, standing up normally with your hands by your side in neutral position, what can you do to change that, to make it strange? Maybe you're going to stand on an angle. Sit your head forward, bring your shoulders up. Curl into yourself and bring your hands forward. And when you move, you're not going to move just in a normal stance with your feet and your arms walking. You're going to bring this pose in it. And move with the weird parts of your body leading. You leave your head still and move just the body underneath of it. And you stretch your hands into unnatural positions. Can you spread out and be big? Take up space. Look strong, even if you're small. When you come back to neutral, you should feel the difference in your body between what you were doing and where you're standing now. If you're the kind of person who usually just swings your arms very slightly as you walk, can you push that? Can you exaggerate it? Instead of swinging your arms a little bit, can you swing them exaggeratedly? Can you get into that weird, loose, puppet-like walk? But also, never underestimate the power of being still. If you're somebody who usually swings their arms quite a bit, what happens if you don't? What happens if you stand perfectly still? How long can you go without moving at all? Sometimes all you need to do is play into the expectation that you are going to move. People don't want to walk by somebody who's just standing still staring at them because they know that at any second that person might reach out towards them. So you can play with those actions. Walk around the room. Start in a neutral walking position. Walk around. And then start to exaggerate one part of your movement. 
Maybe you're going to exaggerate the way you take a step forward. Play with that for a minute. Walk around exaggerating your steps. Now, choose another part of your body, another part of your motion. Maybe this time it's going to be your hand and the way it moves. Start exaggerating that, playing with that. What can you do with that motion? How far can you push it? Make it unnatural. Now, what happens if you slow down? You go slow. What happens if you turn your walk into a creep? You creep forward. What happens if you start to go faster and faster? What happens if you come to a point where you're almost running, where you're moving frantically? How does that feel in your body? How does it feel to be somebody watching someone move frantically around? What happens if it turns into a skip? So swinging your arms, this time you look kind of happy. You're skipping around. Should somebody be skipping around in a haunted house? You can come to the stop, return to the neutral position. Those movements, the kinds of exaggerations and unnatural things we can do with our body in combination with strange voices, strange facial expressions. Those are the kinds of things that are going to bring fear into the people who are watching us. We can weaponize people's expectations. We can play into the tropes that they're already afraid of. We can be the child or the clown or the big scary biker man or we can break what they expect into pieces. We can take little bits of what they're expecting and little bits of what they could never expect at all. We can't actually do anything to our spectators from on stage or inside of a haunted house. We can't touch them, we can't cover them in blood, we can't do anything that might play into that feeling of horror. So instead, we must use terror, the fear that comes from possibility. We must make them afraid of what could possibly happen. So use every part of yourself, your voice, your face, your body, to imply that something more is waiting to be revealed at any moment. And that is how you're going to get people to be afraid of what you're acting. Thank you all for joining me today. I hope you had a good time. If you have any questions, you can comment them on this video or you can send us a message on any of our social media. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Glenn and Performing Arts. You can join our Discord. Link is in the description down below. Please, if you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. We have videos like this coming out basically every week, as well as live events that happen every month over Zoom. Keep an eye out on our social media for those things. Thank you once again for joining me. I'll remind you that my name is Westy. I'm the director of theater for Glennon Performing Arts. Thank you for watching.